僕ですかダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホースは、ダークホ I've got 12 years of comic history to go through. Without further delay, we're starting in 1987 with the Black and White Special. Written by Randy Stradley and Steve Bissett, the first thing you'll notice about this one shot is that Godzilla looks like that. At first, I found this look rather off putting. It's certainly closer to what he actually looks like than the weird retro sore seen in the Marvel comics, but he looks pretty gross. Once I actually started reading the comic, I realized this gnarly, twisted design actually fits the Grimm story pretty well. The anatomy is pretty inconsistent from panel to panel. Sometimes he looks like the 1984 design, and sometimes he looks like that. But I don't know, I think it makes him look suitably nightmarish. I've been forced to look at this Godzilla for a while now because, you know, I'm editing. So this lumpy Godzilla with sunken in eyes, I think it's really grown on me. But here's what the comic's about. It takes place in the flashback of a woman named Noriko, as she recounts the time her father warned everyone of an age of monsters, which is brought about by a radioactive stone that repeats a call that draws all the monsters to it. This doesn't have the same absurd tone or plotting as the Marvel series. This brings Godzilla back to his darker roots, on top of putting other monsters in the same story. This was made in a post Return of Godzilla world and it shows. The black and white format is striking, even if the illustrations on the human faces can be a little off putting. They're constantly switching between a shaded cartoon style and hyper realism, which I get, the hyper realism shows up when they want to be more dramatic, but I think the rest of the comic looks more appealing when it's not doing that. The paneling is effective and conveys a sense of action really well. The writing is solid. Yeah, this one's alright. I guess it's a little annoying that the narration keeps going, the call, the call, but whatever. On page 12, we can see Godzilla fighting an angurous looking fella, and that's worth bringing up. Dark Horse isn't safe from the same restrictions Marvel had. They had to come up with their own monsters. You're not gonna see any licensed goobers here. They did actually have plans to include more quote unquote archetypes of existing monsters. There are a couple concept designs revealing that they had Angurus, Mothra, and Ghidorah adjacent monsters waiting in the wings, but they ended up not being used. Obvious stand ins like Cybersaur broke through, but I'll talk about that thing when it's relevant. Back to Godzilla 87. The story feels a little incomplete, but as is, it's a short and effective piece. It left me wanting a little more, and a little more does exist. Otherwise, I don't feel too strongly about it. The 1987 black and white Godzilla special is just alright. Let's move on. What the fuck is that? Okay, so this is a parody comic that Dark Horse put out around the same time they got the Godzilla license. It's called Claude Zilla. We are not covering this one. Okay, I guess we are looking at this one. So, uh, Godzilla has a hick cousin named Claude Zilla. The bit is that he's an idiot. Gamera is there. Teddy Ruxpin is one of the monsters destroying the city. Haha, <laughs> funny national debt joke. It's only gotten worse. It's somewhat amusing, but I wasn't slapping my knees over it. The funniest part about this whole thing isn't even a joke in the comic. It's knowing that Dark Horse never got the license to officially put Ghidorah or Godzilla's other foes in their comics, so they were able to put them in this because it's a parody. This goofy horn dog is the closest we'll get to seeing Ghidorah in a Dark Horse comic. So, uh, yeah, back to the official stuff. Released in 1992, the Godzilla Color Special. Is the first entry Arthur Adams was involved with. Not only is he a comic book industry veteran, but he's evidently a pretty big Godzilla fan, and this must have been pretty fun for him. He's the head writer and artist here, and he would go on to do the cover art for a number of Dark Horse's issues, even a bit of IDW's. This comic is also rather historic because it gave us what I believe is the first appearance of Screeonk. Why is this important? Well, for one, it would become the de facto sound effect used for Godzilla's roar in future comics and merchandise. And as far as I can tell, this is the first time it appears. 
The sound effect originated as Kreonk in the 1987 Black and White special, but was also used in Dark Horse's release of the Return of Godzilla manga. But it was this color one-shot issue where the iconic, very important S was added to the front. In this particular instance, it's used as Godzilla groans in pain from a missile strike. If his roar being based on an instance of him in pain isn't true to the tragic origins of the character, then I don't know what else is. I can't believe I wrote a whole fucking paragraph talking about a sound effect that sounds more like a donkey than it does Godzilla. The comic takes place some time after the first, but the first isn't required reading. Here, Godzilla is approaching an island full of people, and it's up to a specialized team to convince the islanders to leave. They don't have to go anywhere, though. They've got a giant rock demon named Gekidojin, who acts as their protector when offered a sacrifice. In both appearance and concept, this guy is pretty much a riff on Daimajin, who you might have read a Wikizilla article or two about and not actually seen any of his movies. They're pretty good, check him out when you can. But yeah, the logline here is Godzilla vs. Daimajin. It's great. Gekidojin is attacking Godzilla. He got in the first blow. But I think we all know what's coming next. Oh, fuck! In addition to Screeonk, one unexpected contribution to the Godzilla series here is the attack team. I'm wondering how coincidental it is, but they're called the G-Force. Yeah, the same name as the attack team in Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2, a movie that came out one year later. It's gotta be a coincidence, I mean, it's great accidental marketing synergy if it is. For the first time ever, we have an American Godzilla comic where Godzilla not only behaves how you would expect, but he actually looks the part too. The design is more closely modeled after that early Heisei look, and he's more like the humorless force of destruction seen in those movies. Compare that to the Marvel version who was also a violent force of nature but still had a soft side. For now, the only visual commonality with Marvel is that Godzilla still has green skin, which I think is a better look for the vibrant world of comics anyways. I'll go up to bat for comic original designs that I find appealing, but steps were taken to make Godzilla look movie accurate here, and I think he looks great. Worth mentioning that they're continuing the tradition of calling Godzilla the Big G. Dum Dum Dugan's spirit lives on. Big fat puss. The clash of the new and the old is a theme here. Modern convenience versus tradition. The G-Force's attitude towards the islanders is callous and lacking perspective, and their modern technology is what allows them to warn the islanders of Godzilla's inevitable collision. It's convenient to know when you're about to get stepped on. Conversely, the islanders' way of life isn't harming anyone, except for the person needed to be sacrificed to resurrect Stone Shrek over here. But still, they have a means of fending off Godzilla. They're not as helpless as the G-Force thinks they are. Godzilla, a product of man's science, is free and dangerous, while Super Shrek, a product of old world beliefs, is safe but trapped. I think this is solidified by the final panel, where the spirit of the person who sacrificed themselves to resurrect the demon is forever trapped in a relic of the past, while Godzilla is unrestricted, for better or worse. Scary ambition versus safe tradition. There are positives and negatives to both, but you shouldn't underestimate either of them. That's what I got out of it, at least. It's not a deep metaphor, and I'm probably reading into it, but it's the closest these comics get to having tangible themes, so appreciate them while they're here. It's still a fun read, and you don't have to think too hard about it. This is one of the best comics so far. The art is great, the action is conveyed effectively, and it's so good that it makes me wish that the 90s movies were more like it. There's a whole multi-issue series that spun off of this, so I look forward to enjoying that too. So let's talk about it. Well, we can't talk about it yet, actually. There are a couple one-shots that happened in between. You see, the proper Godzilla Dark Horse series wouldn't start until 1995, and they had to pay the bills somehow, so we got these. Welcome to the Space Jam. Sir Charles Barkley. What can you really say about the guy? I mean, I don't know what to say. I'm not a basketball fan. Most of my knowledge comes from Shut Up and Jam Gaiden and Space Jam remixes. But that's the thing, isn't it? I'm not a basketball fan, but I've still heard of the guy. He's a legend. His chaos dunk may have taken billions of lives, but by god if that doesn't make him a veritable threat to the King of the Monsters, I don't know what else does. I can't even believe something like this exists. 
A little background, you can't talk about this comic without talking about the marketing blitz behind it. In 1992, shoe company Nike and Toho produced a short commercial where Godzilla and a giant Barkley had an impromptu 1v1 in the middle of the city. The Lakers are looking for a big man. So a year later, in December of 1993, Dark Horse put out this comic book with the same general premise of Barkley fighting Godzilla, now with a way more convoluted setup. So convoluted, in fact, that the story is credited to Alan Smithy. There is a piece of Godzilla media that uses the name Alan Smithy. That's awesome. Anyways, here's what happens. G Godzilla is coming. Warn the authorities. Evacuate the coast. Godzilla? He must be in shock. Never heard of him. No, man, don't you know who Godzilla is? He's a monster. I guess the biggest monster of all time. They call him the king of the monsters. What are you, king of the liars? Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Look out there! Godzilla! When Godzilla suddenly appears, a kid named Matthew begs Sir Charles, who he believes is the Earth's greatest warrior, to fight the big green bastard. How? Well, Matthew has the silver dollar that his grandpa gave him, and it somehow allows Barkley to grow to giant size. He challenges Goji to a couple rounds of basketball, and then the story just kinda ends. I never said this was a good comic. Going from the color special to this, the absence of Art Adams is very noticeable. The colors here are bold, but the faces are a little off. Outside of a handful of panels, Godzilla holds himself together at least. He looks weirdly cute in a couple panels, too. Worth mentioning that they allude to a specialized team coming in to deal with Godzilla. This line suggests that they're talking about the G-Force, which in some messed up way implies that this has some ground in the main Dark Horse canon. But whatever, nothing ever comes of it. The writing here is just bizarre. Some of the strangest excuses to get from point A to point B. Silver dollar contrivance aside, Charles just drops everything just because some random kid who did a sick skateboard trick in front of him said only he could stop the giant radioactive dinosaur. I mean, if someone did a sick skateboard trick in front of me, I'd probably believe everything they said, but you know, that's beside the point. And after that, the kid challenges him to a game of b-ball, less than a couple blocks away from Godzilla's rampage. For the story, this happens so that he can flip the silver dollar to see who goes first and make Barkley grow. But Matthew doesn't know that, so this is just lame writing. He fires his publicist team, by the way, all because Matt played into his ego. What if you say something that offends someone, like a little old lady in Vermont? You guys. Tell her to write to me, okay? Now give us some space. It gets good when the basketball game starts, but even the conclusion to that feels weak. Barkley beats Godzilla by tricking him into practicing in a remote canyon, seemingly for the next 100 years. Uh, great job, idiot. That just means Godzilla's gonna come back in the next century proficiently slinging around a basketball. His footprints will be Nike branded. It'll be a PR disaster. Who will be around to stop him then? Mecha Michael Jordan? Don't kid yourself. You've done nothing but delay mankind's inevitable sports-themed apocalypse instead of putting this big dumb dingus out of his misery now. For shame, Sir Charles. For shame. Anyways, Godzilla vs. Barkley is the greatest piece of media ever produced. The concept is profoundly lame, but the comic gets by on that premise for me. It's just so goofy and terrible. Sure, the art is wonky and the flow of the story is nonsensical, but you see, Godzilla gets busy. That's enough for me. You could argue that he should be destroying cities instead of doing what NBA Hall of Famer Charles Barkley tells him to do, but I believe Godzilla is like a dog in that he just sort of does things arbitrarily. They gotta bring in LeBron James if they ever make a sequel, which needs to happen for the record. We've been sorely missing NBA-themed monster crossovers lately. This is a uniquely terrible comic, and I kind of like it. Up next is Godzilla vs. Hero Zero. Who the hell is that? <laughs> Ironically, I think more kaiju fans know who Charles Barkley is than this guy. One look at him and my immediate thought is, that's Ultraman. They're not shy about their source of inspiration, too. 
I recently asked comic book nerd friend H. Squid to do some voice acting, and upon hearing that I was going to cover this comic, they went ahead and whipped up a paragraph of research, completely unprompted. So yeah, thanks for doing the work for me. Hero Zero Alter Ego David McRae is a 14-year-old boy who shares his body with a mysterious entity known as Zero, who allows him to transform into a giant superhero. So yes, even the setup is very similar to Ultraman's. In fact, there's a bit of Ultraman great in the dynamic, because David is able to converse with the hero. He debuted in issue 2 of Comics Greatest World, and right on the first page introducing him, there's a Godzilla reference. This was well after Dark Horse had started publishing Godzilla comics, so there was seemingly a desire to have their new size-changing hero meet the King of the Monsters. While he did appear in a good couple issues, his appearances only managed to culminate in a single solo book, Hero Zero, Number Zero. Within the first couple of pages, David states that he's not only ready to fight Godzilla, but Mothra as well. Which is especially strange since we never see Mothra in the Dark Horse comics. Though, again, they did have that Mothra-like creature waiting in the wings. Considering there's a Godzilla toy in his room, I personally think this is supposed to be in the context of Mothra and Godzilla being movie characters, and the crossover happens irrespective of that. And even then, Zero's all like, oh, I don't know, they're pretty powerful, suggesting that they are real. But yeah, it's supposed to be vague. Let's, uh, see how he did against Godzilla, shall we? The setting for this one is kind of refreshing. David is attending the San Diego Comic-Con, with his friend and his dad. When the title of the comic eventually happens, I wasn't expecting the dark turn it takes. See, earlier in the comic, David was flying around as Zero, and his speed inadvertently woke up Godzilla. So he's not only responsible for leading Godzilla to a crowded convention center, but also for the death of his friend. Like, seriously, I wasn't expecting this to be so dour. At the end of the comic, he doesn't want to be a superhero anymore. I feel bad for this kid, especially knowing that this is the last time the character is in the spotlight. Yeah, Godzilla retiring him from superheroing at the end? That sticks. This is one of Zero's final appearances. As of issue 12 of the King of the Monsters run, they were like, yeah, no, we're not bringing this guy back. Sorry. Beyond this, he has one final appearance in The Mask World Tour Issue 1, and it really only amounts to being cannon fodder for The Mask's shenanigans. If anything, this bit reads like David is trying to get his superheroing confidence back, and him being so thoroughly defeated by The Mask ends up retiring him for good. It's all one big giant oof. Downer ending aside, I thought this one was okay. The art is appealing, Arthur Adams makes a brief cameo, Hero Zero as a character is kinda whatever, but you know, it's neat to see this Ultraman-like guy fight Godzilla for a bit. And I did end up feeling bad afterwards, so you know, this comic did make me feel something. Ah well, moving on. Here we are, the main event. From 1995 to 1996, Dark Horse began the Godzilla run you're probably more familiar with. Running for 17 issues, it was titled Godzilla King of the Monsters, not to be confused with Marvel's Godzilla King of the Monsters, which isn't to be confused with the 1956 American- The comic takes place in the universe established by the two one-shot specials. In fact, if you don't feel like reading the black and white one, issue zero of this run contains a shorter retelling. It follows the adventures of the G-Force as they track Godzilla across the globe while trying to clean up and prevent his messes. It's very similar to the Marvel comics, from the presence of aliens, to the dedicated Godzilla task force, to the time travel, but you're gonna have to trust me when I say this is a more grounded take. Slightly. It's slightly more grounded. Okay, towards the end it kinda goes off the rails, but it starts out relatively normal. I wasn't too endeared by the G-Force when they were introduced in the color special, but here with the longer run, the comic has the opportunity to flesh them out a little more. Said opportunity only goes so far, but it's something. Kazushi is the leader of the G-Force. He's a scientist man who just kind of stands around. There's his wife Reiko, who similarly does the same standing around. Kazu has his passive-aggressive moments, and Reiko is weirdly interested in her brother's sex life. Mind your own business but they're otherwise pretty boilerplate. There's Reiko's brother Take, the resident mechanic who gets horny on live TV in the second issue, and dispenses the more groan-worthy lines. 
And then there's Kino, the no-nonsense type who talks like an action movie star. Konnichiwa, babies. Him and Take get along the best. For supporting characters, we've got Kate, a hot news reporter Take has a relationship with. She kind of disappears halfway through the run, which is a shame, she was cute. Then there's Noriko. Poor, poor Noriko. She's a character whose involvement in this series goes all the way back to the black and white special, and it really felt like they wasted her here. After losing her entire family to Godzilla, she becomes a scientist and dedicates her life to making him pay. She makes a pretty big mistake early on and gets a lot of grief for it. And she doesn't even get to atone for her mistakes at all. The writers wanted a twist, and it's pretty cheap. I don't know, it didn't feel like they were done with the character. Quickly brushing that aside, there's Burton. Everyone loves Burton. He's a World War II veteran who's introduced to the team thanks to Noriko. He eventually integrates into the G-Force and becomes another wild personality on the team. This cast is alright. Some characters have more personality than others, and in any other medium I think the constant interjections run the risk of getting tiresome, but they work as an ensemble for such an action-heavy series like this. The dialogue here is jokey and playful, yet the comic knows when to get serious, and vice versa, even if it's admittedly jarring. In one instance, they go from talking about the death of a character to talking about Take's relationship with Kate. Damn, dude, that's tragic. Anyways, how's your sex life? Each story arc had a different writer, and overall, I think everyone here did a commendable job at keeping things consistent and punchy. Not always consistent with the quality of the storytelling. I think these stories have a hard time wrapping up without feeling uneven. But I do like how it being segmented into what's basically three big story arcs allows for wildly different things to happen. Well, in truth, uh, I say there are three story arcs, but there's actually three and a half. I'll address that elephant in the room when it's relevant. Relevant? I'll address that elephant in the room when it's relevant. It approaches being an outright parody at points. I expect this kind of zany stuff from comic books, but it really does play fast and loose with the logic. The art of the comic also isn't always consistent. They had a lot of artists and inkers rotating, but it rarely looks outright bad. While I'm sitting here complaining, uh, I guess the typesetting can be a little wonky sometimes. Is that really a big issue? While Marvel had to rely on superheroes and the intervention of the Godzilla squad for many of its issues, here, with the exception of a single arc, the Dark Horse series relies on more monsters for Godzilla to tangle with. Some of them are pretty cool. I like Bagara. He's kind of a retread of Batragon with a cooler design. I know I said in the Marvel video that I hate it when they use fake bullshit versions of existing characters, but I can't deny that the stand-ins for existing monsters are actually pretty cool. Even some of the unused ones from the 1987 special. Cybersaur is a worthy replacement for Mechagodzilla. They're not subtle about the inspiration, though. Sadly, some of these guys only get a single issue to leave an impression. The ones that do stick around are cool enough, at least. Issue 14 has a random Shockerous cameo. You know, the things crawling on a Godzilla in the 1984 movie. The one monster they could get away with bringing back, and it was a goddamn bug. As for Godzilla, the poor guy keeps getting kneecapped. In the first issue, he gets poisoned, so he has to deal with that for an entire arc. Then he's injected with a cadmium missile, so he can't fire his beam for a while. Then he's trapped in a time loop, and he's tricked into committing atrocities across history. It's gotta be disorienting, it's no wonder he's pissed off all the time. I'm a fire in my laser! Unlike the Marvel Godzilla, who had implied hidden depths and a weird moral code, this Godzilla isn't that much different from the ones seen in the early Heisei and Showa movies. He's an unstoppable and unpredictable force of nature. He's also fat as hell in this panel, like goddamn dude. While the tragedy and metaphorical use of Godzilla has led to some of his best stories, another appealing aspect is that he's a giant laser-spewing monster. That's rad as hell, and the writers knew that. They had a respect and understanding of what fans liked about the character. He's a cranky old dinosaur with that tragic angle of being too big and angry for his own good. Yet you still understand why he lashes out because of what science has done to him. He can also dunk a mean basketball. They got that part right too. Simply put, Dark Horse Godzilla feels like Godzilla, and Godzilla's pretty cool. 
This was a comic book series in the late 90s, a notoriously bad time for the industry, so the covers for these are full of edgy, eye-catching imagery and language to grab the attention of potential readers, as edgy as they can get at least. He's thirsty. For blood. Bit of a lie there, Goji's frothing from the mouth because Noriko injected him with poison. He's actually in searing pain. Careful, Bagara. You're biting the hand that'll kill you. It's cheesy as hell. And for as well illustrated these covers are, I think my favorite come from Bob Eggleton, whose involvement in the Godzilla series started here at Dark Horse, specifically with an alternate cover of the Godzilla manga that I didn't talk about in this video. Sorry. Slight tangent, but another bonus to going through Godzilla's comic book history is seeing the fan mail get more and more specific and nerdy. We've got letters here referring to Space Godzilla and Baby Godzilla, before their movies even came out here. This was the mid-90s. Because of the internet, the dedicated fandom as we know it is finally here. For better or worse. Hell, people who worked on this comic grew up with the character, and the trend of fans growing up to write and illustrate official Godzilla comics didn't stop either. I just think the passage of time can be neat. If you're a young Godzilla fan and an artist, you too might be writing a Godzilla comic 20 years from now. Or something like that, I don't know, I'm not good with this inspirational crap. Okay, so highlights. The Diani invasion arc is my favorite. It has some of the weakest art in the run, but it was written by Arthur Adams, and this is where I think the zanier story elements were handled the best, before it really got off the rails. The black hole apes from Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla get involved. I genuinely did not see that coming. Sorry if this video was how you found out about it. No, get your sticking paws off that, you damn dirty ape! Ooh. I'm especially enamored by the dialogue between the Diani aliens. They're treating all of this like a game, and they're underestimating just how much Godzilla could rock their shit. Issues 6 and 7 have some of my favorite moments from this run because of their reactions. It's hilarious. There's this bit where a Diani warrior uses the arm of his fallen comrade to fight the thing that just killed him. That's great, I love that. At one point, the comic implies that Henry Kissinger was a diabolical android. Rest in piss, by the way. The arc where I think the comic loses its marbles is the one where Godzilla gets sent back in time. It's still fun, but it's also very messy. It does have a weak setup. The guy who built the time machine gun for the G-Force is a mad scientist who wants to loot the past and sell his findings through infomercials and eBay. But I'm not done yet! Call right now, and I'll triple the offer! And it's only after they send Godzilla back in time that they wonder what they just did to him and question the guy who built it. I guess the implication is that they were tricked, but shouldn't they test an experimental weapon like this? That's what I mean when I say this series can be a bit sloppy sometimes. Things exist, or just happen, to get from point A to point B. Sometimes it's hard to wrap my head around, but it's not a big deal. And it's just fun to do a time travel story where the characters get to visit a variety of locations. It freshens things up a bit. They also get to meet Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Isn't it funny how this happens? How almost every new Godzilla continuity, if allowed to go for too long, gets a little quirky? Like almost every other long-running Godzilla continuity, this one also started with an attempt to harken back to the 1954 film. Starting with a grim story about anger and revenge from the perspective of a small child, and eventually reaching a point where Godzilla has to fight a mech named the Altarantula. This happens through a combination of changing social attitudes about what people want to see in serialized kaiju media, and the stories becoming less personal as the focus of the narrative shifts and the scope of the ongoing conflict grows. There are obvious exceptions, of course, but there's a reason why the human characters just keep feeling more and more superfluous. Also nowadays, with writers and directors hopping onto projects with the explicit purpose of paying tribute to Godzilla's goofier era of the 60s and 70s. And I do have preferences. Personally, I think Godzilla's best entries tend to be more ambitious in how they weave the human element with the kaiju action. Whether it's by giving them a goal or character arc, or if they become a point of view for the action and that allows for spectacle, or you do something completely unorthodox and you make an entire group of people the protagonist. There aren't strict rules for these things. Whatever works. If I'm following these characters for 90 minutes, they better do something at the end. Preferably if it's not by way of hack screenwriting. I gotta die here with you and so 
over! But now I'm just letting my opinions on the movies encroach too much on this video about the comics. Oopsie. Point is, is that I think there's room for something to just be fantastical and crazy. That's part of the fun of monster media. As Randy Stradley puts it in the godzilla -gram section of issue 11, grim and gritty is fine once in a while, but it won't do for a steady diet. It makes sense for things to get bigger and more lighthearted with sequels, and in many cases it can be quite fun. As long as it's not egregiously bad or boring, I'm not gonna complain. It can be disappointing to see someone's moodier vision get thrown out because the next in line wanted to do something else. They're allowed to do that, it's just a little disappointing. But in the case of Dark Horse Godzilla, the people involved with it from the beginning are still working on it towards the end. And I'm still having a good time. The characters chase Godzilla around, they crack jokes, he slams a monster into a building. It's very similar to what Marvel was doing, and that's not a bad thing. It's actually quite exhilarating in practice. These comics have a great blend of pulpy monster action, plus the necessary and reasonably charming human perspective to make those set pieces feel important. The writing can be kinda bad in places, that's justified criticism, but it's never enough to stop the comic from being what it's set out to be, a big silly romp that celebrates Godzilla. The Dark Horse comics are very fun, and I'm sure they would have gotten even zanier if the team was allowed to actually conclude them on their own terms. Uh-oh, it's time to address the relevant elephant in the room. Fan support evidently wasn't enough. There was an industry-wide issue. Comic book shops were disappearing all across the country, and interest in the heavy hitters was waning. It started off well enough in the early 90s, but by 1996, things were pretty bad. That seems impossible to fathom considering all the cool and epic video games and TV shows coming out at the time. Hell, Batman Forever just grossed over $300 million at the box office. So the demand to see comic book characters in more mediums was there, there just wasn't as much interest in the comics. My power, my pleasure, my from a speculator market losing interest because of overstated values, to the quality of the actual comics getting worse, nobody knows the single thing that killed the industry, but from what I could gather, it was a multitude of problems that snowballed. They must be killing him off because he wasn't selling enough comic books. There's doom and gloom in the pages of the comic too. Stradley has an editorial talking about the situation. Speaking as someone who isn't actively into comic books, I can understand why this would happen from a consumer's perspective. Comic books are kind of hard to get into, you gotta do some research if you want to figure out the best starting point. The average person isn't gonna know that they need to start with the 1987 black and white special, you know? Having actually read the Dark Horse comic, each new arc is pretty accessible if you're going in blind, but the average consumer isn't gonna know that. But once you've found out how much you want to read and where to start, you'll find that they have a lot to offer. Comic books are a valid and entertaining medium. They don't always get respect, sometimes for good reason, but I wouldn't be doing this video series if I wasn't interested in reading more comics. Especially ones with this guy. It's just a shame that Godzilla was kind of caught in the crossfire of the whole comic industry imploding. Whether we have the actual numbers or not, Dark Horse's Godzilla unfortunately ended its run premature at issue 16. Worst of all, it was in the middle of starting a new story arc with this mad scientist, Dr. Yamazaki. There is one more story that followed the final issue. It was published in a Dark Horse anniversary special, and it provides a bit of backstory for Yamazaki, revealing she was another survivor of Godzilla's many rampages and she was seeking revenge. She may have seemed like a generic mad scientist with immaculate drip at first, but after reading this, I would have liked to see where this arc went. Maybe they could have drawn parallels between her and Noriko, who also dedicated her life to killing Godzilla. I don't expect this kind of clarity from these comics, but it might have been interesting. In the same story, we get a peek at Godzilla's origins as the characters speculate how he came to be, and it ends with the hint that Godzilla might become an unexpected savior as he battles the next wave of kaiju. But that's the note the last entry of the Dark Horse canon ends on. There's no sense of finality, they wanted to make more but never got around to it. Dark Horse did republish their existing work in 1998 to capitalize on the release of the Roland Emmerich movie, and after that they just let the license expire. Which, gotta say, reading the fan mail and seeing people excitedly looking forward to Godzilla 98, very unfortunate in hindsight. At least the final issue is one of the best in the run. 
Not only was it penciled and written by one of my favorite Godzilla artists, Bob Eggleton, but it's refreshingly simple. Doesn't have anything to do with the arc they just started, it's just here to leave the reader with a memorable story. Godzilla awakens in the past, whether it's a dream or time travel is deliberately unclear. There's no dialogue, just narration. It's a great little piece that gives a brief insight on Godzilla's thought process, and highlights the tragedy of returning to a world he can't live in anymore. Missed opportunity that we wouldn't get something that exclusively followed Godzilla like this until the Monster vs. Dominion, but as a quick test run of the concept, it's pretty good. In the King of the Monsters run, it's overall also pretty good. For the most part, I think every artist did a good job, the character banter can be entertaining, the monsters Godzilla fights are appealing, and the action is exhilarating. This drum keeps being beaten, but I had a fun time with it, regardless of how sloppy it could be. Part of me still likes the Marvel comics more because they're just so charmingly retro. The Dark Horse series is nevertheless still worth reading if you're a fan. Just don't expect a proper ending. It doesn't really have one. Rest in peace, D.H. Goji. You deserved better. Wait a minute, there's more? I'm gonna make this one brief because this video is going over length, but yeah, wow, Dark Horse made one more comic. It actually came out in February of 96, halfway through the main series, but I'll count it last because it's funny to consider this the last thing they did. It's called Godzilla's Day, and like Claudzilla, there isn't much to say. It is a lot funnier, dare I say I actually thought it was pretty good. But yeah, the premise is that there's a new building in Osaka and Godzilla is trying to get at it, presumably to do Godzilla things to it. The characters run around screaming for a bit before realizing he's looking for a back scratcher, so they build him one to calm him down. It's amusing. The way jokes are paced with panel beats got me pretty good. The art is deliberately wacky and grotesque. I thought that was fun. I will say, um, the Osaka building is called the World Trade Center, so we get panels that look like this. Go ahead, you can use these out of context. What else do you want me to say? I enjoyed it. Now we're done with Dark Horse, yeah. Looking back on their time with Godzilla, they used him about as well as they could have. It's hard to not feel like there could have been more, especially with the main series getting cancelled. But what we got satisfied the Godzilla-shaped brain worm in my head. My recommendations are the Color Special, the main 17 issue run, and Godzilla vs. Barkley, if you're feeling a little quirky. I know I'll never have another opportunity to talk about it, so I have to give a brief mention to Dark Horse's other kaiju efforts. They did a Gamera comic. It's pretty weird. It's a sequel to Guardian of the Universe, and with hindsight, it doesn't at all line up with what would go on to happen in Advent of Legion. It is interesting and worth checking out, but it did even worse than the Godzilla run, only managing four issues. Dark Horse also put out an Ultraman Tiga comic. I have not read this one. Tiga is one of my favorite Ultra shows, so I'm at least intrigued. I'll probably do a video on it, maybe. D.H. Goji isn't dead either. The comics got released in Japan for the first time recently, and Super 7 put out a figure based on the cover art of issue 1. So there, it ain't dead. This video isn't over by the way, I gotta do some cleanup. <laughs> Yeah, there were Godzilla comics produced in the 90s from different companies. Two of them. The more substantial of the two is a 1994 comic from the toy company Trendmasters. Godzilla, King of the Monsters, Monster Island Unleashed. They put this one out to tie in with their action figure toy line. You know, the one with Hench Baragon. The comic was released in both black and white and color, but I only have the black and white version. So this uh, color credit is pretty superfluous. The story is super complicated, try not to get lost. There's an evil corporation named Genko, and they steal Godzilla's egg. They want to use it as a bioweapon or something. Accompanied by a scrungly Mothra and Rodan, both making their comic book debuts here, Godzilla travels to New York and fights Mechagodzilla and Mechakinkadora, also making their debuts here, before taking his egg and going home. Got all that? Good. It's a very complicated story. The action's a little hard to follow, but the big and bold line work is appealing enough. Godzilla Force reporting. Situation under control. Not. This was a tie-in for a toy line, pure and simple. In fact, in order to get this, you had to buy one of the toys. One thing I'll give Monster Island Unleashed, it creates another wrinkle in the Godzilla egg debate. The comic says this is his egg. Does he have a dead wife? Did he adopt this one too? 
It's about as vague as it is in the movies, so go ahead and argue amongst yourselves in the comments. I'm gonna toss a grenade into this discussion. I think he reproduces asexually, like Zilla. Speaking of... Yes, there are two very short comics made for Godzilla the series, each published in issues 34 and 37 of the Fox Kids magazine. One of them is a brief glimpse at a scene in the three-part Monster Wars special from the show, where Godzilla emerges in Washington, D.C. to fight a monster army controlled by aliens. It amounts to a brief advertisement. The second comic is an original story where Cameron Winter, a villain from the show, holds Godzilla hostage before the Heat team arrives to save his ass. With both comics lasting a whopping three pages each, they tie for being the shortest printed Godzilla media yet. The human characters look bugged out of their minds. Nigel dies again. Junior's roar is spelled like Shriek. 10 out of 10, would skim through again. And with that, we're done. We're actually done. The 90s are over. No more Godzilla comics for the next 12 years. Yay. I'm sure that was fun to live through. Subscribe, hit that like button, and click the bell notification because in the next episode, I'll be talking about the IDW comics which are the longest running, oh god, oh man, oh god, oh man, oh god, oh man. <laughs>this is already turning into the longest video I'm gonna make this year, so I'm gonna keep this end slate short. Thanks for making it to the end, and special thanks to my patrons for helping make videos like this one possible, and for being good sports about me taking so long. The top patrons are Kidorian, Scooter Jit, Mego Muddy, Chris Space Cowboy, Lobotomy Blues, Cool Bell Zero, Pack Jeff, Johnny Hedgewolf, Eric Guzda, Janos Firewalker, Easterman, Macho Mantis, Jackson Flint, Manila Fan, Sampai, Big Dumb Media, Novak15, Jacob Hinch, Dude Bro, Alistair Gilmore, Seamus Kelly, Anonymous Euronymous1349, Fujoshi Urinal, Grazio, Mulan Nguyen, Irrelevant402, Krazak53, Queer Kaiju, Chronicler Waba, Alcoholic Alligators, Ryan Santa Cruz, Avak Robot, the Antagonist, Godzilla Rich, It's God Z, An Actual Demetrodon, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you all very much.